This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at the Microsoft Surface Pro 2. The Pro line is the one that has Intel Core i5 CPU inside, runs full Windows 64-bit. A lot of improvements inside, we're going to look at them now. So this is the new Microsoft Surface Pro 2. Obviously, the number two there is a second generation Windows tablet. This time, Windows 8.1 is preloaded. Starts at $899, just like the last generation model, but this time you get Intel Haswell 4th generation CPU inside, which makes for much better battery life. That was certainly a sore point for the original Surface, so we're real thrilled to see that. Some improvement in, in performance as well, definitely a noticeable improvement in graphics performance. Haswell does have a faster integrated GPU there. And we have more configurations available. With the last one, it was your i5 with 4 gigs of RAM and your 128 gig SSD. Not a whole lot of variation going on there. Now we have a bunch of different models to choose from. You could also get one with even less storage. You could have gotten one with the 64 gigs. And still, even this one starts. The base model at 899 has 64 gig SSD. You really don't want that one. For that $100, I'm telling you, 64 gigs is just not enough, especially because the operating system takes up a good portion of that space. Anyway, 128 is probably the model most people are going to go for. That's 999. The, the version that we have here has 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. That brings you up to 1299. And you can even get a 512 gig SSD. Apparently, the, the, the 512 and 256 models with 8 gigs of RAM are pretty popular because right now Microsoft's website, this is the week of release, already says you're going to have to wait till December 15th for those models if you order it directly from MicrosoftStore.com. Wow. In terms of looks and design, it looks exactly the same as the last generation model. Now, for those of you who know the touch covers and type covers, this is the type cover 2 here. Purple, new color, so right away you can tell that that's a different one. We'll talk about those in a minute. Snaps on, snaps off with that same impressive, super duper strong magnet. Just put it anywhere near, it's going to latch on there. You can swing the tablet from that keyboard if you wanted to. Don't know why you would want to. Take a look at the side here. Same color as the last one. Same size, same weight, still 2 pounds, 0.53 inches thick. Still have the same air gap over here for ventilation around the sides. The same 10.6 inch, 1920 by 1080 full HD display. Now they have actually improved the display quality. The color gamut is wider on this one. The last one wasn't bad. This one's even nicer, better color gamut. Pretty good black levels, pretty good white levels as well. It's optically bonded glass, just like on the Surface 2, which is the Windows RT version of this tablet that costs less money. But as you can see, there's still plenty of glare, even though when they bond the surface of the glass on, it's supposed to reduce internal reflections. So much for that. On the side here, we have our volume controls. There's our headphone mic combo jack, USB 3.0 port. There is only one port, so they didn't bother color coding it. Obviously, we have the kickstand. Now you get two different settings for that, which is good because that was a complaint a lot of people had. Now, if you're using it on your lap, for example, or at a low table, you needed to tilt back further. So here's the position we all know already, like about 24 degrees, and then we have the 40 degree. And as you heard, it's a pretty stiff lock kind of thing, so you feel the two positions. So that makes it great for using on your lap, again, and lower tables, that kind of thing, because we don't always have a nice high desk or office table to use. Very sturdy as always. The plate runs across the back here. That puts it a little bit ahead of the Sony Vio Tap 11, which may have an infinite or near infinite level of adjustments. You know, you can go from any position you want with that, but it has single strut, so you really can't use that to rest on your lap. Thanks to this large plate here, you, you can do it. It won't be the most sturdy thing ever, but it's good enough. Hinge is well mounted here. Pick it up, shake it around. You can see the spring-loaded mechanisms on each side over here. There's our dock connector for the keyboard. Right now you can get the type cover to, the touch cover to, or you can use the original ones if you want as well. We'll talk about that, like I said. And there are going to be a variety of accessories for this as well. There's even going to be a docking station next year. On this side, aha, the pen. That's what sets Surface Pro apart from the regular Surface. Wacom pen right here, tablet PC enabled style pen, just like the last one. 1024 levels of pressure sensitivity. Works nicely. Again, we'll get to that one soon. But anyway, as with the last generation, it mounts magnetically using the POGO connector right here. That's where the charger goes also, and it just locks right in. It's not, you know, foolproof. If you're going to carry it in your case, it's possible it could get knocked off, but it's better than the Sony Vio Duo 13 arrangement with a little plastic clip, at least. 
stereo speakers, one on each side. You can see one of the holes over here, and this is our mini display port. You can get display adapters, so you can get one that goes to HDMI if you need. You can go to full-size display port, so it's quite versatile, also VGA. Power button is up top over here. We have built-in microphones as well, front and rear 720p cameras. One above the display there, which is where you would expect it to be. Another one on the back, right over there. Just 720p. So Surface 2, the cheaper Windows RT model, actually has better cameras. That has a 3.5 megapixel on the front and a 5 megapixel on the rear, because it's competing with mobile OS tablets rather than laptops, which seem sadly stuck at 720p for their webcams. Got the nice rubbery, fairly compact charger here. It still has a USB port so you can charge your smartphone as well from this. Pogo style connector has a little light on it now so you actually know when it's charging and it's a little less fiddly to connect and you can put it either way, down or up now, which is nice. You won't see light if you put it that way very easily. Two prong connector. Separable over here, so of course, depending on international version, you might get different prongs with yours, but standard sort of laptop arrangement there where the brick does disconnect a reasonable amount of cabling here, so you don't have to be too super close to the outlet. You have your choice of two kinds of keyboard covers, just as you did before. We have both of the updated models here. First, this is the touch cover, too, fabric y kind of feel. Uh, it's capacitive, like it's, it's got touch sensors on it, so nothing's going to move. These keys are slightly raised so you can feel them. What's new is much more sensitive. You don't have to press as hard and deliberately on the keys anymore. It's amazing. I can just fly on this keyboard. It's definitely a great improvement. It's not cheap either. It's $120. Also, it has backlighting, multi-stage backlighting, which is something that seems pretty impressive. More rigid as well, too. So $120 for this. If you want the new one, make sure you get the new one that says touch keyboard too, otherwise you're going to get the older model, which is probably being discounted now. And the back is kind of a more vinyl -y rather than a felt look to it now. Better looking than vinyl, okay. It's not bad looking at all, but it doesn't pick up too much dirt, it's good. On the other hand, for those of you who like the clicky keys, definitely with the first generation Surface keyboards, I was loving this one a lot more, but the touch cover has gotten so good, I'm actually finding that I like it, especially because it's about three ounces lighter, saves you a little weight, but anyway. Gone is that kind of cheesy plasticky rest here, and now this is fabricy. The touchpad is also fabricy right here, which is a little bit weird, but okay. So you have regular style keyboard here. The keys move a little bit, improved key travel. This one is also backlit. So for those of you who want a more traditional typing experience, this would be a good choice. Also quite rigid. A little over nine ounces, so it's not really very heavy. Doesn't add a lot of weight. We have fabric on the back here. Don't worry, guys. It's available in colors other than purple. And as ever, I have long fingers, but not huge, huge hands, and I can type on this, but it's still a 10.6 inch typing experience. So for those of you who want to use this as your primary laptop, you, can, you might want to consider a USB or a Bluetooth keyboard if you need more room on this. I think it's fine, but I know some of you fellows have really big hands, and you might just find it hard to get your hands in on here. Microsoft will also be offering yet another keyboard option that's going to have a secondary battery that should be out by the beginning of next year as well. And there's a Bluetooth accessory too that mates these guys wirelessly, the tablet and this. Uh, as I said with our regular Surface 2 review, I'm not sure how many people are going to use that. If they really want to use the keyboard remotely, they're probably just going to use a Bluetooth keyboard instead, but it'll be there as an option in case you want it. As 10-inch tablets go, a lot of them have been Atom so far. This is one of the few that has Intel Core i5, and again, as I said, Haswell besides. So you have the latest generation 1.6 gigahertz dual-core Haswell CPU with Intel HD 4400 graphics. It's, it feels quite fast. Uh, the last one was no slouch. It was pretty quick, too, and part of it is also Windows 8.1. is actually a little bit more sprightly, and this ships with Windows 8.1 with UI improvements in tow as well. In terms of synthetic benchmarks for this guy with the Core i5 and 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD, all of them have an M SATA SSD. So far they're all made by the same company, so we shouldn't expect to see much storage variance there. PC market scored 4905, which is a good healthy score for a Core i5 at 1.6 gigahertz. 3D Mark performance level test P983. That's a very good number. Dual channel RAM obviously in there helping that score along, but Microsoft's eking out some good performance, and that's impressive because this is a small thin tablet. That means there's not a whole lot of room for heat dissipation here. There are two fans inside. Microsoft actually set them to not run quite as much and it still stays reasonably cool. When I was playing Civ 
five for a half an hour. The core temperatures were at 56 degrees Celsius, and that's well below the over 100 degrees that's allowable for the CPU. So it's working effectively there. So anyway, good graphics performance, and yes, it can play Civ 5. We'll show you. For the 3D Mark Ice Storm test, it scored over 42,000, which makes it almost four times faster as Surface 2, which is running Windows RT on a Tegra 4 mobile CPU. And so for Geekbench 2, the 64-bit test it scored 7,712. So very competitive performance. Really, it's a marvel in something that's two pounds, fairly thin, not much room for cooling again. It, it's good, and it doesn't get burning hot. Now, if you're doing something like playing Civ or running 3D benchmarks, you'll feel some heat on the back. It's not going to burn your hand off or anything like that, though. We expect to feel some heat. As with the first generation Surface Pro, this is really an ultrabook in tablet clothing. You're looking at full Windows 64-bit Windows 8.1 Pro on our unit right here. Can run all Windows programs. You have the Metro UI, the desktop UI, of course, you'll get that no matter what. You can see we can use it with our pen as well. And if we go over to desktop over here, full Windows 8.1 or 8 if you want to say it that way, experience. Notice we have a little start menu down here. If you right click on this, you can get to all sorts of power user settings now. That's a change. Otherwise, what it's going to do, if you just do a quick tap, is it's going to toggle you back to this interface over here, the Metro interface. But if we do a press and hold, let's see if I can do that with the pen, you can see you can do things like get to your system settings, event viewer, disk management, command prompt for your DOS style prompt, task manager, stuff like that. So still not the traditional Windows start menu we knew from Windows 7, but there are third party utilities that will bring that back if you're still missing it. I don't miss it too much. If you want to get to all programs, this is the new way to do it. Swipe up from the middle. There it is. You don't hit Windows key plus Q anymore to bring that up. That will just bring you into an app search. By the way, you can really launch any app and find any file using that feature, but here's all of our installed programs right here. So easy enough to get to that stuff too. But for those of you who are keyboard lovers, just hit Windows Q and type in, start to type in the title of the application you want and you'll get it and you can just hit the enter key. It's pretty darn easy. Our model with the 256 gig SSD had 212 gigs free. Recovery partition takes up space. Windows takes up space. Some of the built-in applications also take in space. Unlike Windows RT, you're not going to get free Office included. So you tap on that little Office icon. You can try or you can buy, or you can activate it if you already have a Office key. So not included with this, just like it's not included with Ultrabooks, you're going to actually have to pay for Office. Now for those of you who want to take notes using OneNote, uh, the application of your choice, even use a program like ArtRage, all of those applications that use the modern Windows Ink API, which include Office programs, you've got pressure sensitivity right off the bat, and you get palm rejection as well, which means you can rest your hand on the screen while you're writing or drawing. Now for Shall we call them now legacy apps like Adobe, Adobe Photoshop CS6 or we've got the Creative Cloud running, version running right here. You need something called a WinTab driver. For those who followed the original service, you knew it took a while for that driver to come out from Wacom who makes this digital pen technology. It's now here and they have the Wacom Feel It driver. You do have to go to Wacom's website to download that and install that, but once you do, you'll get pressure sensitivity in all your WinTab apps. Like for example, Photoshop right here, Corel Painter. So I've got the paintbrush selected and I'm doing I'm going to spend time doing a whole lot of artwork but you can see the, the gradation I'm going to do some very light lines right now and then I'm going to do a heavy line see the difference easy beautiful pressure sensitivity there it is in Photoshop and of course at this end we have the eraser function typical awaken pens now tracking has been pretty good that's been one thing ever since Windows 8 came out Entrig was actually pulling ahead even though they didn't have WinTab drivers that's another issue but uh, they had a little bit better accuracy with no offsets to the pen point and now this is actually quite good all the way out to the edges is doing a good job so progress there and now we're in Corel Painter 12 and we're going to try out the same test right here very light lines because I'm going lightly right now and then if I want a heavy line yeah and the tracking speeds also pretty good there's you can see I can spiral pretty quickly before there starts to be any kind of delay so for your artist types, again, a 10.6 inch, also a very nice form factor to hold, great for art, and fast enough to run any of your art programs you want, Manga Studio, Paint Tool SAI, Photoshop, certainly Corel Painter 12 or the latest X3 version, they're all going to run great on this. 
And that's where this also has a leg up over Android. So like the Galaxy Note 10.1 and 2014 editions of that, that has a Wacom pen too. But the selection of serious art programs, it's just not as evolved as it is on Windows still. So if, if you're pretty serious into art, I would still pick a Windows tablet over an Android tablet at this point. Now here's where things get a little shocking in terms of size. Usually we think of a 13.3 inch as an ultra portable, wouldn't you? This is the Sony Vio Duo 13. Look at the difference in size between these two, right? So if you're getting something with keen portability in mind, and even lighter weight because the Sony still is considerably heavier, even heavier for even though it's a convertible tablet, you get the idea right there. Now the Sony has a digital pen as well. That's an Entrig digital pen, and we all have a SmackDown comparison between these two for those of you who can't design. The machine, as I said, has an MSATA SSD inside, not the new PCIe, but the numbers are pretty good, as you can see here, fairly competitive among MSATA SSDs. And honestly, at this point, uh, I can't think of much that you're going to be doing where the difference between MSATA and PCIe is something you're going to be able to tell. And actually using the machine in real life, it's nice in terms of specifications. But anyway, those are certainly respectable numbers there. Speaking of that MSATA SSD, it is in theory, upgradable. It is socketed, standard MSATA interface inside of here. The RAM is soldered on, but the whole thing is pretty darn difficult to take apart. First, you have to use a heat gun and separate the display section from the side and get open up a whole lot of little tools with the sludging tool. I don't think anybody here is going to be opening this up to do an upgrade themselves. Really, it's pretty hard to not destroy something in the process. Likewise, the battery is sealed inside. If you need to get it replaced, should it die of old age, I'd say send it into Microsoft because just getting it apart is going to be the hard part. Once you do, that battery is held in place by screws and it's got a regular physical connector, so you, you, it's not soldered on. You could do it, but getting inside, again, the scary part. Machine has dual band Marvel Wi Fi 802.11bgn, not AC. I don't think AC is going to worry anybody right now. It's great for in faster intranet transfer speeds. If you happen to have an AC network, most companies really don't because they upgrade their networking hardware slowly. Anyway, 802.11n, no problems so far with reception, with throughput, with bandwidth has been very good on this. Streaming full HD video works just fine on it. That also has integrated Bluetooth 4.0. Battery life, it still has the same 42 watt hour battery as the last model, but Haswell has made a difference. And I think Microsoft's tuning also of the operating system and the thermal control, how often the fan comes on, has meant for significantly better battery life. That was one of the things that really kept me away from the original Surface Pro, much as I liked it. It was the three, three and a half hour battery life. Now we're looking at something more along the average of six hours with 50% brightness, and it's a pretty bright display. By the way, auto brightness on this actually works. I know with some manufacturers, if auto brightness is on, you get something that is either way too twitchy or way too dim. Works well on this. 50% brightness with auto brightness on at the same time, Wi-Fi on and active in a mix of productivity and some fun stuff like streaming some Netflix, doing about six hours or so. So clearly there's Ultrabooks that are going to last you longer, but in the 10.6 inch size, you don't have that much space for a bigger battery. Ultrabooks really do have an advantage there, so they can have longer battery life. And I think six is acceptable for a lot more people, whereas the original Surface, not so much. Now we're going to test out Civ 5 and listen to those speakers. Definitely an improvement of the first generation Surface Pro that had pretty vimpy speakers. These are much nicer. Dolby enhanced audio. Civ 5 is touch enabled. I know a lot of you ask about this game. I myself love to play it, so we'll give it a try. So here we have a game that I started. Again, I'm about a half an hour into this. I'm running this at full HD 1920 by 1080. Some medium settings, some low settings. You can pinch zoom and scroll around. There's my second city. So it plays just fine, and the turn speeds are pretty quick. Core i5 can handle this, not a problem. Is running around autonomously just as they should with good speed. Touch control works fine on this. We have 10 points of multi touch on this screen. And for those of you who are wondering, I know you always ask yes, it can play Minecraft. 
You could also play Left 4 Dead 2 on this. You could play World of Warcraft at low settings, and I would go with 1366 by 768, and then you could play it. This is not something you're going to play Battlefield 4 on. This is Intel HD 4400 integrated graphics. You want dedicated graphics or something like Call of Duty latest version or Battlefield 4. So that's Civ 5 playing on our Surface Pro 2. And that was a Steam game. So as you can see, yes, Steam runs on it just fine too. So those of you who are Steam fans will be happy to know. Origin fans, I feel sorry for you if you are, but yes, you can put Origin on this too. And we can hear the fan running a little bit now. Let's run core temp and see where our temperatures are at. It's not super duper loud, and we made it up to 65 degrees there. Remember, we were playing this on battery too, and that was a performance on battery. Usually with something like an Ultrabook, we plug it in to get maximum performance. So that was actually a pretty fluid performance there. Gets the core temps up some, but nothing to be alarmed about, about appropriate for actually playing something like Civ 5. Yellows are yellow on this display. I know after the Lenovo Yoga 2 Pro where the yellows were not yellow, there was a little issue there. If you saw that Sprint ad, they use a golden yellow. That's the proper yellow there, by the way. And we'll just test out a little streaming video here in the video review. Now, you all know that this is going to work just fine because this is a Windows PC, just like an Ultrabook. I'll bring up that quality. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're going to look at a pretty cool tablet. This is the Samsung Galaxy Note 10.1 2014 edition. Yes, it is 2013 right now, but it's called the 2014 edition, so this is the second generation of the 10... So obviously if you want to do something more fun like Netflix or Amazon Prime Video, which I'd love to show you, but Google's little DRM servers would have a cow, so we can't... You can play all of your movies on there, your TV shows, you name it. It's going to work nicely, and it's a very nice screen, too. So who is this product for? Uh, just like the last Surface Pro, it's for you tech geeks who love really amazing technology, because it is, and it's beautiful aspirational hardware still. You just look at it and you kind of want to own it if you're a geeky kind of person. Beyond that, anybody who needs ultra-portable computing, and I mean people who think that a 13-inch MacBook Air is kind of bulky, obviously this is going to be a lot smaller. You take this and you take the keyboard, which doesn't add much weight. This one is 6.8 ounces. The, the one with the clicky keys is under 9 ounces. You're still talking lighter than any Ultrabook on the market. Very compact. Just like that, you've got both screen protection and you've got your keyboard on here. So IT types who have to do server maintenance on the go, graphic artists who want to have their portable sketch pad and painting canvas really anywhere available. Those of you who travel a lot on planes and know that even a 13-inch Ultrabook sometimes doesn't fit on those sad, sad keyboard, rather, food trays that they put on the seats these days. Anybody who needs mobile computing in a small package, of course, the drawback is going to be, it is a small package. 10.6 inches is a little bit small. DPI scaling works pretty well. Some third-party apps like Photoshop do ignore it, so you'll have sort of small menus, but Overall, for those of you who like to have a bigger screen experience for watching movies, for working on spreadsheets, this is going to be small. You can plug it into an external monitor. You can put this on your desktop and use it just like you would a laptop as a consolation prize there, but on the go, everything's going to be smaller. So that's the Microsoft Surface Pro 2. It's available now starting at $899. Keyboard cover not included. Again, it's still the best crossover that we've seen between a tablet and an actual Windows PC. Yes, the screen is small. It depends on what you need in a laptop. You might want something bigger. But if you need portability, if you need the digital pen, particularly for you artists with that Wacom inside, it's a great choice. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full review. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.